Hi and welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. If you haven't already subscribed, please do. And also if you haven't watched my others, please go through my playlist and watch them all immediately after this. Today I'm going to be covering a really challenging case to cover. I'm so conflicted in this case. I think I know where I think and feel and then I learn more and it completely conflicts with my original belief system. So, when I first started learning about Dali Routier's life, I just thought she was guilty of the manicide so that she'd murdered her two children, her two young boys. She did have three children, but that she'd murdered a five and six year old. And that was something that genuinely stuck with me for a long time. And then I watched Susanna Reid. She was interviewing her on a crime program and something just pricked my interest and I don't know whether it was because I was struggling to know whether what she was saying felt rehearsed. And then I started thinking, well, if I've been in death row for over 20 years, I'm probably going to have told my story a lot of times. And if I've told my story a lot of times, the memory will become of a memory, not of a reality. Because I don't think people understand that. You never memorise an event as it is. You remember the memory of the initial memory and then with every new memory often you add or lose so that's why people's stories can sometimes change over time some people would say well that can seem deceptive actually that's very very normal think about it i mean i don't know about you guys but when i was a teenager i used to embellish every event you know it went from a very ordinary friday night to like the best friday night in the whole enormous world and everybody just had the best time ever and they're probably there the people that didn't even come it's just the way that you kind of play with things in your mind. So it started to kind of hook me in, but I knew that this case was going to take a lot of work as far as kind of understanding both sides. And the point is she's still on death row now. So currently, in spite of people trying to get appeals and then being rejected, and still an appeal is going to go in, it will be her final appeal, actually, if it ever gets accepted. What stuck with me is that she still says that she's completely innocent and she does seem to have a lot of people who have come out on her side to mitigate against the prosecution. Now, like I said, totally open-minded. As I sort you through this case, please tell me what you think. I know that some of you will know this case and just be like, she's immediately guilty, she needs to go to the death chamber. And I imagine that some of you are conflicted like me and I imagine that some of you fully believe that Dali Routier is completely innocent. I think it's important at this point before I even start to say that there's been a lot of research on maternal filicide or familicide. And as you'll know from previous viewing of my footage on other cases, 95% of this kind of crime happens by men to children and to by men to wives and children. So this is unusual. But also when you look at Dali Routier, there are none of the red flags that you would expect to see. So no serious mental illness, no revenge issues, no dealing with massive financial burdens, although arguably the prosecution will say that that isn't true, but they'd be lying to you. They'd absolutely be lying to you. I've checked it out. They were not in terrible financial stress, but they did a very good job of making it seem like they were. But nonetheless, she does not fit the profile. There are people occasionally in life that don't fit profiles. That's why some serial killers get away with it, right? Because you don't necessarily fill a profile. And when I go through some of the stuff that she did in the early days after the deaths, it will make you go, nah, that's a bit weird. But again, just keep mindful that this particular case was tried in a particular way, in a particular area, that I think was very much about rubber stamping her guilt before the case was ever truly brought fairly to court. That's my personal opinion. Doesn't mean she's not guilty. Up until now, right now, there is still no plausible explanation as to why she would have killed her children. Now, when you look at other cases like Andrea Yates, she didn't have any psychotic hallucinations. Susan Smith, the South Carolina mother who just drove her kids into a lake and tried to pretend that she hadn't had anything to do with it because she wanted to go off with another man. She obviously then admitted to it. She'd had lots of abuse in her background. Dali didn't have any of that. She didn't even have a criminal record. She didn't even play away in her relationship. There was very little 
to give you any insight that this woman could suddenly snap and become a psychotic murderer of her own apparently loved children. So let's look at where Dahlia came from. She was born in Pennsylvania, then she moves to Lubbock as a teenager with her mum and stepdad. And at that point, she meets Darren. That is a guy who's a few years older than her. He works at a place called Western Sizzlin. He's a cook there and her mum worked there as well. And she was just completely infatuated with him and he was completely infatuated with her. So she's 15 at this time. Obviously, the way that she looks is that typical kind of 80s girl. Her hair is just like bright blonde and she just looked like she fitted in perfectly with that time frame. And I can understand that he would have had his breath taken away from her. She was very different as far as he was concerned to anybody else. He reflected that she was one of those people who set trends and they were that infatuated and inseparable. It only took them like four years before they got married. So she was really young. You know, she was 18, 19 when they got married. And it wasn't some massive affair. They got married in a garden room of his parents' house. And lots and lots of things kind of played out within their life together. He was voted at school to succeed. He was seen as somebody who was going to be academically very effective. So Darren is definitely somebody who wants to prove that he's going to come through with that belief of his peers, that he's going to make some of himself. And they move to Dallas. He starts a small company of his own. It's something that tests electronic components and it starts doing well. This is in the early 90s. The early 90s was the time of the yuppie. It was a time where people carried around mobile phones that were so heavy that they gave themselves back injuries. That's how big the phones were. Look back at the pictures that I'll post. The words, ridiculous. I remember when phones got smaller and I was like, what is the use of this tiny phone? And now they're kind of somewhere in between, aren't they? But back in the day, it literally took you to go to the workout at the gym seven times a week for you just to be able to carry around your enormous mobile. But it was yuppie time and money started to be made. And obviously he was at the cutting edge in this way and that meant that he started turning over a lot of money for that time. By 1995, that same company that Darren has created is bringing in about half a million dollars in gross revenues, right? So he's paying himself this annual salary of 125, 130,000, meaning that they're in the 2% top bracket for their age. That in itself shows you this is a really successful couple. What I'd say about Darren and Dali, when I say that, I just wanna go to the two Ds. But when I talk about Darren and Dali, they do stand out a little bit in the neighborhood. Because one, they're really young and successful. And you know when you're young, and you're successful and you might not have come from wealth. Often I see the psychology of this being really overt. It's almost going over the top with your items. I see it quite a lot when people have made a lot of money quickly. It's not that they don't have class. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it's such a contrast to their previous experiences that they're more flamboyant. And when you're more flamboyant, you might have things in situ in your home that other people might find a little bit overbearing, even a little bit common. But if you've not had wealth and something costs a lot, you can assume therefore that it's worth a lot and it will seem to other people to be worth a lot. So one of the things about her jewelry that was very, very flashy, and to somebody like myself, I mean, I don't really wear a lot of jewelry at all, I kind of look at that and it's more symbolic. It's saying to other people, look, we're doing really well. But as young people starting to do really well, I think probably wanting to let people in the neighborhood know that they were thriving, that external use of props from the massive chandelier that they had in the house, the marble surfaces, the rings, the jewelry, it kind of psychologically makes sense. Another thing that I think is unfair to Darley and to Darren is the way that their marriage has been made out throughout. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But it seems to be this constant prosecution suggestion that they had this terrible marriage, but the whole neighborhood's been interviewed about them and they were really well loved. And they were well loved, not just because they were kind to their neighbors and they went out of their way to be pleasant. It's that they genuinely were inviting, they invited the children of the neighborhood into their home. They had a games room, which the kids lovingly described as the Nintendo room because they were all allowed to go around and play. And I will say 
that I was reading a piece where the person who'd done the interview suggested that they were kind of Dallas's version of the Clampets, the Beverly Hillbillies. I don't know whether any of you remember that. I'm gonna tell you a story about, never mind, that's the opening titles, Beverly Hillbillies. But I can understand why they were very wealthy, but the way that they looked was very different. You know, Darren kind of wore these muscle shirts and had big diamond watches and Dali at the time where boob implants were not necessarily the going thing, she just went for it. She got size 36 DDD breast implants and she just used to wear these really tight fitting tops because really she was so tiny that obviously that top heavy look, it's something that immediately you could not notice. It's the first thing that I noticed actually about her when I started looking at the case. She was constantly having her nails done, her hair done. She bought a toy Pomeranian dog with white hair matching her own basically. These are the type of things that are used against Dali. So it's almost as if because she's female and attractive and she's had a boob job and she's got a dog that matches her hair, which let me tell you, <laughs> is very common. It really is, be honest. We've all watched Housewives of I Don't Know Everywhere. I think there's been a Housewives of Everywhere, hasn't there? They're all at it. They've all got matching cats and dogs with their own outfits and that's fine. It doesn't make you a murderer. It does, in my opinion, occasionally make you a little bit flamboyant and extravagant in the way that you appear. But hey, knock yourself out. I think that Dali just wanted to stand out. You know, when you've come from kind of normal beginnings and you've got your own boat, a business, a flashy house, then why not have fun? I mean, I imagine it must be really nice having loads of money. And that's what she's doing. And she's loved by the neighbours. She's known as the cookie mom. She is the person who invites children into her home so they can all eat cookies together. I know I'm drawing a picture of a massive psychopath here, aren't I? Oh, those known psychopaths bring the kids in, feed them with cookies, let them watch Nintendo, send them home safely. She sounds like a badum. It's also worth noting that Darian, her husband, had actually designed the kids' playroom. And that, to me, again, introduces us to this idea of them being loving parents. She's had three children, by the way. There's also a young child that doesn't get murdered in this situation, which I'll talk about later on. Also to note, after Dali is arrested, she actually has kids from her locality putting signs in her front yard saying that she's innocent. So again, it kind of gets me a little bit that this is the reaction of the people who felt that they knew her. Now I know that people are married to serial killers and I know that people believe their partners when they've been incestuously abusing their children, I get it. So I know that what goes on behind closed doors does not always play out, I appreciate that. We can just say that from the public's perspective, who knew them, she wasn't the type of person they expected to be guilty of a crime. Also, I have to say that my friend's father worked with Dr. Harold Shipman, and when he murdered thousands of people, they got thousands of cards saying that he was clearly innocent. I appreciate if you don't know somebody fully, you don't know them, and even sometimes when you think you know someone fully, you still don't know them. So I'm just bringing that in because I think when I go through the prosecution case, you will see that there is definitely a bias because of the way that she looks and because of the way that they believe she has acted. Another thing that kind of creeps into my conscience is I do know that at one point she even paid a mortgage for a neighbor who had cancer and who couldn't make the payment. And so it makes me think about empathy and conscience. So if you think about a narcissist or a psychopath, the likelihood of them going out of their way for anybody is, is really minimal, unless there's gonna be an absolute gain. So you might go and do that if you're gonna end up on the front of the papers with this picture of you handing over the check. But it doesn't seem that this was the way at all. It was just done because she felt very sorry for this particular individual who was unwell. By 1996, there were problems with Darren's business. But let me tell you, only like we would expect, in the late 90s, things did start to slide a little bit. His business wasn't doing as well as he could have been doing. He was late on the mortgage by one month. One month, okay? 
just one month. Now I'm also going to acknowledge that arrears back in the day were taken more seriously than today. We have a lot more flexibility because everybody gets repossessed and then that's not good for the economy. Wonder what's going to happen soon though, after being locked down and furloughed for a year in the UK and other places, but who knows? Who knows? Probably not repossessions and landlords getting really rich, but that's another one that I'll do later on when those crimes get dealt with. But being late on the mortgage is not something that says that you're going under. It means you're late. He owe $10,000 in taxes. Again, lots of people owe money to HMRC in the UK or the IRS in America. And they have $12,000 on credit cards. Hmm, that's what a credit card's for. Sorry, that drives me mad. The prosecution brought this in as if they were absolutely going under. You're going under when as somebody I knew was 196 million in debt. At that point, I'm like, you de they should stop lending. Or maybe when a government's six trillion pounds in debt, maybe stop lending. But if we're going to say that debt is huge, we're not going to suggest that, you know, $22,000 and a month's rent or mortgage owed is in severe financial strife. It's just not ideal, but it's certainly manageable. They have things that they can sell, like a massive house and a boat. So... Again, remember that when I talk about the prosecution's case, financial motive is going to be a big part of it. There is no financial motive at this point. Also, be aware, the boys who were murdered, they were worth $10,000 in a payout, 5,000 each. Darley was worth $250,000 if she was killed. So the kids are worth 10,000, she's worth $250,000. So the financial gain from killing the children doesn't really register. As far as I'm concerned, there isn't enough there to suggest that she would have benefited or in fact, the family would have benefited in any way. Now behind closed doors, as I've said, things can always go badly wrong. But according to the friends and family, particularly the family, and you do tend to confide in family members when things are going down, no one saw that there was any problems in the marriage. No one saw that there were problems in their finances. No one saw that they were struggling in any obvious emotional way. Yes, I will talk a little bit about the fact that Dali definitely was struggling a little bit after the birth of her third child. She hadn't had a period for a year. It had really played on her mind. And then when she finally got her period, she actually felt fantastic. And that was in the weeks leading up to the deaths of her children. So she was actually in a really good state of mind. But I will go through some stuff that kind of introduces you again, what was brought into the prosecution. Darren is a businessman. He knows that they need to get back on track. So because he's a hard worker, he thinks I'll just start a new company. He calls it Champagne Wishes. God, that sounds so delicious, doesn't it? Champagne Wishes. I've never been anywhere as luxurious as that. But he'd take people who were basically on his boat around a lake, they'd sip champagne, and they basically could sleep in the room that was on the boat if they wanted to. This meant that Darren and Darley weren't seeming to show that there were any great problems for one another or with each other. She didn't ever stop shopping, that's one thing that we know for sure. We also know that she was planning to go away with friends in the summer and she was gonna go away to Cancun, which is pretty exotic. As I mentioned, there was some psychological unsettlement where Dali was concerned during the year after the birth of her child, but it wasn't something that would have been considered really severe PND. She did write in a diary, just remember, if you write in diaries, be careful what you write, it can be used in evidence against you, and I really mean that. Think of some of the stuff that you've written in diaries. I mean, I've written, when I've journaled things that people would probably lock me up for because it's me venting to myself, right? It's not for the eyes of anyone else. I can say really horrible things if I want to. It's not actually real. When I was a teenager, the amount of poor me and the world is better off without me, things that I would write. I remember Dali isn't massively older. You know, she's in her tw 20s. It's still very young. I was completely self-indulgent. Were you? I mean, the stuff I would come out with in my diary, it's just toe curling. But at the time I felt it. And so there's this entry, basically says, I hope that one day you'll forgive me for what I'm about to do. 
my life has been such a hard fight for such a long time. I just can't find the strength to keep fighting anymore. And she was considering taking some sleeping pills to kill herself. But she didn't take it. Simple as that. And when she went through that feeling, she talked to her husband. He came back, spoke to her. He told her that he wanted her to be okay. She discussed with him how she felt. And that was it. That was done. She got the support that she needed. And she described that as just this passing, fleeting moment. Because as I said, she hadn't had a period. And once it came, she was just really, really happy. Lots of women out there going, really? You're happy when you get your period? That's a crazy thing to do. But you know what I mean? For her, that was really important. She liked having children, so she was probably worried about the fact that she might not be able to conceive again. One of her friends did actually give us some advice because she herself had had some inpatient treatment after being postnatally depressed that she could seek help. But the truth is that Darley didn't feel she needed it. And actually Barbara Jobel, who gave her the advice, said that she didn't think she needed it either. And by late May, everything seemed great in the family. Dali and Darian took the boys to Scarborough Fair, which is basically a fair where people were dress in medieval costumes. And she was really flamboyant. She was really out there. She wore a belly dancing outfit. Wouldn't be my choice. I'm more a sack kind of outfit. I'm like, oh, Maybe I can go as a pauper with no shape. That's what I'd do. But each to their own. She was quite extravagant. On the 5th of June, so this is just before the murders take place, the day passed like every other day. The boys were in a hot tub and basically at night she cuddled up on the sofa with her two boys, Damon and Devon. You know, they're watching TV. They had one of these really big TVs and it had just been installed and it was left on and she says that she fell asleep. Even though that evening her and her husband had literally stayed up talking and kissed each other goodnight, for whatever reason she had stayed downstairs. Now it is possible isn't it that they'd had a row. He had the baby upstairs with him, they could have been discussing their marriage, they could have been discussing their problems. We don't really know. We can never know that. But we do know that Darley did curl up on the couch downstairs with her boys. I mean, that was a treat for me. I'm still like that. You know, if I can get one of my teenage sons lay down next to me in my arms, I'm never happier. So they're teenagers. When my boys were like five and six, they were with me constantly, perpetually, stepped in the same bed. You know, that's what close parents are like. And the fact that she said that she just wanted to be with them, she wanted to watch over them. I've got pictures that I would take of my children sleeping because I knew that they'd be fleeting. You know, they'd be ghosts of my babies one day. So I can completely connect and empathize with a mother who just wants to spend time with her children and just feels that connection. And because school had basically finished, it meant that there weren't the same rigorous routines that were required. And also because she was somebody who said that she kind of suffered a little bit from insomnia because she was quite a light sleeper and her issue was that if Drake, who was her third son, turned over in his cot, then the likelihood is that she wake up. So sometimes she just snuggled up on the couch with the boys and I completely connect with that. The 911 call is totally distressing. It's distressing because of the content, but it's more distressing to me because of the way that she sounds. Dali sounds utterly hysterical. I mean, beyond frantic, beyond terrified. I listen to people for authenticity. I really do. And I have listened to phone calls like Lewis Danes, I have listened to phone calls that involve people that genuinely, the minute I hear them speak, I know that they're lying. Because they're trying to portray something or they're trying to act in a certain way and it doesn't come across. You're so unpredictable in hysteria. Believe me, I've been through one of the most traumatic experiences in my life just coming up two years ago. I am the calmest person in a panic. I lost the plot completely. I was hysterical. So I do know what hysteria sounds like. I've heard it in my own ears with my own voice. And when I listen to Dali, she is 
hysterical. She's screaming that somebody stabbed the kids. And she's screaming about the scene and the fact that one of them is dying and that she thinks he's dead. And then, as you'll hear, she's saying that there's a knife and she's been told don't pick up the knife, but she's saying, I have, I've already picked it up. And oh my God, the fingerprints. Again, that's used against her as if she's trying to suggest that she won't have been able to get the fingerprints of the person who killed them because she touched it. But just listen to the call and make your own mind up about the authenticity. Uh, I'm wondering what is your emergency? Oh my God, I'm
struggle at this point this is the bit that gets me conflicted because unless she's in a complete state of disassociation and denial i.e she's had some kind of psychotic episode some psychotic break killed her children and then genuinely come round from it and has seen the scene and believes that her children have been killed which i suppose is some kind of stretch then arguably that is possible I become a little bit less convinced of that possibility later on when I'll go through what has been discovered about what would have needed to take place for her to have created the crime scene and also to have planted a piece of evidence about 75 feet away, all the while bleeding nearly to death from her own throat. But like I said, disassociation can occur, psychotic breaks from reality do occur, people do terrible things and they don't have any memory of it. So. It is a possibility. So both Devon Rute, who was just six, and Damon Rute, who was just five, were both murdered as they were sleeping on the ground floor with their mother. You know? Devon was stabbed twice and he was stabbed so severely that he was basically impaled. It went pretty much all the way through his body. And then Damon, his brother, was stabbed many times, and that was in the back. That idea of frenzied killing is something that always kind of affects me because a frenzied killing usually comes from what's known as a disorganised offender. A disorganised offender isn't very good at dealing with the scene and also a disorganised offender is likely to use like overkill and stabbing a child several times in the back would be considered that kind of overkill. So that's the scene that we're met with. Now, Dali, who's sleeping as well downstairs, she has changed her story quite a few times. Again, just try to put yourself in a position where you've been asleep and you're coming around. Very few of us wake up with an instantaneous reaction of reality. You know, we're dealing with what is unfolding in front of us. And if something unfolding in front of us is like so outside the realms of rationality and reality for us, then I do think that there is an excuse for somebody to feel confused and also to not really process and take in the information around them. Other people in trauma can become like super memorized, but a lot of people become really confused. What we do know is she's been sliced in the right forearm, one in the left shoulder, and her throat has been cut. Now listen, some people, including the prosecution, said that she had superficial knife wounds. She missed a carotid artery by two millimetres, right? If you slice that, she actually did nick it, but they managed to prevent it bleeding out. If you do that, you will bleed out in a matter of minutes. No one will save you. So if she's inflicted those wounds on herself, she's come damn close to killing herself as well as the children. So in cases of familicide, that happens. The offender does kill themselves as well. That's more common. But why then does she go and call for an ambulance? You know, she's tried to kill herself. Why does she do that? But nonetheless, that's what happens, as you've heard. Now, in a written statement that she gave to police a few days later, all without a lawyer present, so Darley literally didn't consider herself a suspect. She wasn't acting like she was guilty because she didn't get a lawyer. 
So as far as she's concerned, when she's being interviewed by the police, there is no reason to have an attorney present. And she recalled being awakened by Damon, basically pushing on her shoulder and saying, mummy, mummy. But at that point, she didn't actually realise that he was her. What she did notice is because the television was there and the light was on, she could see a man, the presence of a man. And she actually got up, she followed him through the kitchen and into where the garage would be. But when she noticed the utility room, she saw that there was a knife. And at that point, she picks up this knife. And at that point, she realises that there's been an intruder, there's a knife, and potentially she's dealing with a crime scene. But only then does she actually notice that her sons have been stabbed. And that's when basically she starts screaming as far as her husband, Darren, is concerned. So he's upstairs with Drake. He comes downstairs because he also hears a glass smash. Like I said, the stories change a little from time to time, but he hears his wife screams. She's obviously on the phone at this moment to the first responders, and he starts trying to give CPR to Devon. But at that point, the person who had intruded into the home, by her account, has disappeared. Now, the problem that I have with the next part of this is because I know what prejudice and bias looks like, and so do you. We've all done it, right? We've all made a decision about somebody or something before the truth has come out. And sometimes our gut instinct's correct, and sometimes we realise that we were influenced by other factors. Now, the police do become suspicious because of the 911 call, because they feel that when, as you heard, she's kind of hysterical, she needs to tell the person who's going to send the ambulance that she's been near the knife. Essentially saying that her fingerprints are on it. You know, in the fact that she hopes that this won't mean that they can't get the attacker's fingerprints. Arguably, you could equally say, all this woman is thinking about is, Jesus Christ, my children have been murdered. I hope to God I get the bastard who's done this. Please let the knife have prints on. Another problem is that a police officer who I've seen interviewed over multiple years on multiple occasions says that Darley just didn't tend to her sons at all, even when he was asking her to. She says that is an absolute lie. From day one, she has denied that, that was the case. And remember, she's been on the phone a long time around that area because she's been speaking to the person who's been spending out the first responders. And she's got a towel because obviously she's realized that she's bleeding heavily now, but she flat denies it. And she's stuck to that story since day one. But this particular officer believes that that was the case. He said that he definitely saw Darren working on one of the children because he kept seeing the blood come out of his chest every time he was trying to pump and do CPR and he knew that he was dying but he felt that she was more despondent. I don't know how you go from hysteria to despondent in a matter of seconds. I suppose you can go from hysteria to shock. But again, the fact that this particular officer has a bias about how a woman in that situation should be acting, that's the main prerogative of his statement. He's saying, I expect a mother to be the person holding that child doing what I said to that child because that's what a loving parent does. Arguably, she says that's exactly what she did, that she went over and she held her son as he was dying and she told him to be strong. And the last words that he said to her were, okay, mummy, and nodded his head. So she recalls a very different set of circumstances. Another problem that we've got is the testimony of the nurses who attended to Dali at the hospital. They said that she was quite despondent. She didn't get hysterical when she was told that her children were dead and they had an expectation that she should do. Again, I don't know. This is why I'm so conflicted. Did she get hysterical at the hospital? Have people's ideas of that changed as things in the news have come out? Because believe me, when you think about a fair trial, I'll tell you something, she didn't get one. Whether she's guilty or innocent, she didn't get a fair trial. And it's amazing how many people come out with a whole load of bull when they start believing that you are guilty of something. People run away from guilty often, they run away, and then they become part of the story by creating additional factors. So I don't know whether that happened, I don't know whether the nurses are telling the truth. Sorry, I'm not calling them liars, I'm just saying, I've seen it time and time and time again where everyone gets involved with the story. I've seen it during the COVID epidemic 
You know, I've seen people go on TV and lie and then get found out for lying. I've seen it in Grenfell in the UK, the fire here. That happened where loads of people made stuff up. In 9-11, I've seen people literally lie and say they were part of the story. People do do that. It's not nice within human nature, but it's highly evident. Even though they had no eyewitnesses as far as the prosecution went, no confessions, no motive, what they felt and still feel today very, very strongly is that they had a high level of circumstantial evidence that as far as they are concerned meant there was no intruder that night. I also want to make it clear that it was a highly chaotic scene that was going on. Whilst they talk about forensics and DNA being like at the cutting edge when they were dealing with it and hundreds of pieces being brought in, like the most that had ever been brought in in a case, personally, I think it was massively chaotic. I think if you go through the data in detail, the likelihood is there's a huge amount of cross-contamination and there's a huge amount of movement within that house that shouldn't have occurred. Yes, they had guards outside, but they didn't go in, even though they formed very quick opinions, but definitely there was chaos within there. So evidence in itself, I don't think was dealt with very effectively. And I think that when you're dealing with circumstantial evidence and then trying to pin a trail of circumstantial evidence to create the perfect jigsaw of guilt, you have to make sure that the evidence seen has not had any tampering with. And I don't believe that she got a fair shot at that either. But again, doesn't mean she's not guilty. But on the night that these murders take place and everything's happening, the police decided to bring in a retired detective called James Crone. And that was because he'd been involved in other cases of similarity. It took him a really short amount of time, like a surprisingly short amount of time to decide that there was no assailant, there had been no break-in, it was staged, and that basically the offender who had carried out the murders was either Darley or Darren. That was for him an open and shut case. And again, there seems to have been quite a lot of bias around the officers who were there. For example, she's accused of being around a kitchen and a towel but actually as if that had been placed there, whereas it could quite possibly have been that she'd been around there when she was dealing with her neck wounds. And the officer did admit that he didn't even ask her that question, but it's used against her. So it seems to be that there's a group of men who arrive on a scene with two gorgeous babies who've been horribly murdered and automatically are deciding that they're gonna point the finger at the parents. Probably because statistically it is far more likely than a random attack. But we do have the fly in the ointment, which is that Darley herself has been almost mortally wounded. Now, again, when the prosecution were building their case, they got doctors to say that her wounds were superficial and self-inflicted. But arguably, when you look at them, they didn't look like they'd simply been an attempt to suggest that she'd been slightly injured. I mean, that neck injury in itself could have killed her. They do say that because her shirt had different holes in it, that they felt that they were essentially hesitation holes. So like where somebody goes to stab themselves and then it's like naturally reflexes from it, which is kind of what people do because understandably you think you can hurt yourself but when it comes to doing it, it's kind of like, oh, that knee jerk reaction and that natural preservation just steps in and stops you. But what was really the nail in the coffin for Darley is that seven days after the murders, it would have been Devon's seventh birthday. What you are shown on TV is a scene that I saw. And this is what I'm talking about bias. When I saw the scene on TV, when I looked at the first documentary made about her and the news channel, I was like, you are absolutely 100% guilty. This is just insanely obvious. This is Diane Downs, the killer of her own children, all over again. Because it's a group of family around this beautiful seven-year-old boy's grave, or what would have been his seventh birthday. And they've got party bags and balloons and they're using silly string and she's chewing gum and they're all smiling. And you're like, that is totally off center. I mean, 
I don't know what was going on in any of their heads. I know that when I was dealing with the loss of my father, I just didn't even know how to speak for a while. The last thing I would have been doing seven days after my children had been brutally murdered would be dressed up with my makeup on, using silly string to celebrate my kid's birthday. Just wouldn't happen at his grave. And that for me sealed her fate. That's why I'm so conflicted because that act really took me aback. What I didn't know at the time and what was kept from everybody was that they'd had a two hour really somber ceremony at the church celebrating his life before that, where they'd gone out of their way to cry and be desperately sad and to mourn together. So the picture that you see is not the picture of the entire evidence. I still think it's weird as hell. It's weird as hell to do that, to actually spray silly string on the grave and make it like a birthday because that's your kid's corpse. And the last thing you should be doing is celebrating his birthday when all your energy should be going into catching the person who's done this. So I do understand fully that if I was a juror and I had been shown that, I wouldn't have been able to see any evidence without thinking you are guilty as hell. That would be it. That was all I would need. And that is terrible, isn't it? Because that means instantaneously I have complete bias against this family. Not just against this woman. I'm biased against the family. I'm like, how can I trust this family's testimony? They're doing this weird as hell thing where they're spraying silly string over a newly murdered child's grave. But then I've never been in that situation. I don't know whether they felt a need to keep him alive in that way. I don't know. When you listen to Darley talk about it, she said that was not something that would have been out of the ordinary for them as a family because he loved silly string. He loved parties. She wanted to represent they still have meaning. And in some ways, who am I to judge her reality, whatever that is. That film that was showed several times to the jury, the Dallas County Assistant District Attorney Greg Davis said, Here's a mother who has supposedly been the victim of a violent crime. She's just lost two children, and yet she's out, literally dancing on their graves. Oh my God, it's such emotional language, isn't it? And there she is, apparently doing so. The smiling, the big hair, the makeup. But we hadn't seen the two hours of grieving before. And everybody has a different way of processing grief. Even if every single one of us watching that now is like, that is freaky as hell. And I bet you a lot of you listening now were on the fence about what I was saying and what you know about her so far and are now at the point where you go in, she's gooey. So I appreciate that what you've seen will definitely influence the way that you feel. But just stay with it for a bit. So within eight months of that playing out, she is not only tried, she is convicted. She's even convicted in a state that is known for giving the death penalty really easily. In fact, a detective told another lawyer that if he ever was murdered, could they make damn sure his case was heard in Carryville? Because Carryville is a place where they show no mercy. No one quite understands why it was moved from there. It was because they said that, you know, there was bias in the locality, but man, there was bias all over the world, let alone in a jurisdiction known for having a penchant for sending people to the death chamber like that. But that's where she went. It does seem to be as if there was some calculation about, we definitely want her dead. Should, should we, do we all agree? Do we all agree in this room? She killed her kids. We could have it at maybe a place where they'll just give her life without parole, but let's go death. Let's go for death. You can just feel that. And that's why that happened, in my opinion. And at that point, the book could have closed, couldn't it? She was a mother. She'd lost her way. She got financial burdens. She was having marital problems. She was depressed. And one night, from going from the cookie, cooking, loving, Nintendo, playing with other kids, house 
open to the neighborhood type of blonde, happy human to a murderous psychopath who murdered children that up until that point, she was seen as not only a loving, but a doting mother over. And when a book was written about her and quite a few paperbacks were written about her, they basically called her evil. They character assassinated her. But if you look back, there's an authoress who wrote one of those books and she is horrified because she believed everything she heard. She believed the prosecution. She saw her as an evil narcissist. And then over time, she got a phone call from a police officer and he showed her a lot of different evidence. And she walked away from that, doing more investigations, realizing that if she had seen half of what she was shown and half of what wasn't introduced, her perception would have been very different. And she feels quite guilty that she contributed to the way that the world has seen Dali as a human being. And it isn't just authors who've changed their mind because one of the things that I want to make clear here is that Dali's family have fought for her forever. None of them believe she did it. Her husband, Darren, who's now an ex-husband, he's with somebody else now, they mutually agreed to divorce so he could get on with his life, has stood by her wholeheartedly. He said that she could never have murdered my child, my children. It wasn't in her. So she's been fully, fully protected by those who love her. And again, yes, a lot of us want to do that when we can't believe that somebody is capable of murder. So that could be the case. They could just not want to believe that she's capable of this. But a juror who was on the actual jury has seen new evidence and it stayed with him his whole life. He can't believe that he weren't guilty. He saw that video of her at the grave and that sealed her doom. And he knows other jurors who don't want to be in TV, who don't want to be talked about because they feel guilty about it or identified, they feel exactly the same. So over time, as opposed to guilt being solidified, it feels like the cracks started to show because there seems to have been a much more deeper dig into the prosecutor's manipulation by their evidence. And they will say, well, no, we showed all the evidence, but think about being a jury. How many pictures do you want to look through of children being basically gutted in their own home? I mean, I don't want to see more than two or three pictures. I don't need to. So if they had 150 pictures, and believe me, they had at least that, and you want the ones that kind of show that maybe the evidence isn't quite as set in stone, you're going to put them interspersed with these harrowing ones because that's going to affect your brain. All that you're going to be seeing is the horror, and all you're going to want to do is to create justice. It's known that the human brain, a normal human adult brain, has a protective mechanism to make sure that children are saved. That's why we throw ourselves in front of cars for strangers' kids. You have it in you. So if all you're seeing is children who've been horrifically murdered and having it reinforced that a woman has done this, my God, your brain is going to be seeing and feeling that, and you are going to be building a bias to back that up. Dali hasn't just had one lot of people defend her like her family. She has got loads of different sites. Go on for daliarutia.org, for example. They've had millions of hits because more and more people are doing documentaries on this. And basically that true crime author I'm talking about has gone online and said that if she'd been shown the particular pictures showing that Dali was basically bleeding out and she'd been shown those photographs, she would have said Dali was a victim of a completely savage attack. Even after she'd been sentenced, they brought people in to try to get her to confess. You know, they've always wanted her to say, yeah, you know what, I did do it. They even offered her an opportunity so that if she did, she could have got life. But she didn't want that. She'd rather be dead than be considered a murderer of her own children. Again, arguably a narcissist could be somebody who'd rather kill themselves than be known for something they're not willing to acknowledge reality for. But it does seem to be that after 20 odd years in pretty much isolation, 
she's sticking to her story fully. Like I said, if you go back and watch her videos and her interviews and her documentaries, you will feel that at the end she's become quite rehearsed, but that is what happens after repetition. You want to make sure that the emotion that feels less tight and tied because it's been bubble wrapped by time, you want to feel like you can preserve it enough so that you can show off that you still feel these feelings, which inevitably she will to some degree, but not the same as she will have in the onslaught aftermath of what happened. Even after the trial, you think about the fact that Darren, her husband, he had his children's faces tattooed and his wife's face tattooed on his arm. So he's not ashamed. He doesn't believe that she did anything. So the prosecution, as far as they're concerned, they had an open and shut case. They feel that, and still do feel, that they have the right murderer. They absolutely stand by their stories. The prosecution still fully believe that they have an open and shut case. They do not in any way think that she is anything but an evil woman. They think she's manipulating the system. They want her dead. They think she's had too long a life. And the sooner that she can be put to death, the better, as far as they're concerned. In fact, some of them refer to her as the most evil woman that they've ever met. I'm like, no, no, she's not. Like, I know a lot of cases in America. She's definitely not your most evil woman. I mean, I can list a few, so a little bit of an exaggeration there, but okay, go with your bias. You want her dead, just say it. I don't really care. I just want her dead because we found her guilty and I don't want anybody looking into my case and finding that we did it wrong or manipulated evidence or meant that somebody who was completely guilty got away with murder. I mean, why would you want to do that? You know, that's bias. That's the problem with bias. It means you've closed the book. If you've closed the book, then that's why people get hung or the electric chair or death by lethal injection when they shouldn't have. And that has happened. So unless you're willing to have your book of bias open just a little bit, you're not doing your job, you're a danger. That's it, you're a danger. Any professional who doesn't have that book of bias a little bit open, like the person who wrote the book on her, you're dangerous. You need to believe that in spite of your initial thoughts and feelings, if new evidence arises and arrives, you are damn sure to acknowledge that because you should not be in that job. And I would say that directly to the face of every single one of those detectives and attorneys who have said that it's an open and shut. No, it's not. Because if you're not listening, you're not learning, and if you're not learning, innocent people die, and people who should go to prison get to go free. That's the way it works. So shame on people who have that mindset. Again, I'm not saying she isn't guilty. I'm just saying, doesn't instill me with a lot of faith when people aren't willing to listen to new evidence. Stephen Cooper, in fact, who is somebody that had an analysis conducted by one of the most respected forensic anthropologists actually said that they found a bloody fingerprint on the glass table in the room where the murders took place doesn't fit with the people in that house. It doesn't match Dali's, it doesn't match the boys, it doesn't match Darren. It doesn't even match any of the investigators or emergency workers who were at that house. It belongs to an unidentified adult. Does that, does that not just make them go, well, should we just like maybe, let's, why don't we go with this just for a bit? She's still, she can't do any problems. She's in prison. She's on death row. Maybe we don't kill her yet, but we'll just do a bit more of an investigation, guys. That sounds like a, sounds like a good idea, yeah? Just in case. But honestly, the people who prosecuted her are so against it. They just don't want to go further than this. Same as the sock, the bloody sock that had both her children's blood on it. 75 meters or so away from the house where somehow in around nine minutes, six nearly of which she's on the phone, she was able to kill her boys, smash up the house, stab herself, run while stabbed because they found out that that's what would have had to have happened. There was no trail of blood to the place, put the sock there, run back and stage it in like minutes. Okay, they feel that that was possible. They feel that's practical. I mean, I'm not gonna say for one minute her husband's guilty, by the way, but if I was officers looking at that, I'd probably be like, hmm, who was the bleeding victim? Hmm, who didn't bleed? Hmm, 
who's more likely to have left blood and there's no trail of blood? It's definitely, definitely Darley. You know, I'm not for one minute saying Darren's guilty at all. She's always said he definitely wasn't guilty. I'm saying the theory around it for me would have taken a little bit more of an investigation. And if you do look back in this case, there is an initial conflict of interest really with her own attorney who was representing her own mother and her husband because they had spoken out in her defense and they basically got a gagging order put on them. So then that's a conflict. And unfortunately, I think that that also started to throw the whole of their defense off right at the beginning. Now I agree, I think one of the most troubling and challenging things about this case is for anybody like I have sat at home saying, okay, so let's imagine that Darley and Darren weren't involved in the murder of their children. Why would anybody just turn up, enter somebody's garage window, a few feet from a dog's cage, because that could have caused attention, get through a darkened utility room, basically grab one of the knives in the house that belonged to the house, then stab two boys and then cut this woman's throat. That is confusing. Richard Ramirez did that kind of stuff though. It happens. Random disorganized killers in particular do that stuff. I do not say that that means that that happened. The idea that the place of entry that was cut with a knife that left fibers on a knife that had been put back in the knife rack is also a problem. The prosecution said, why would the murderer or somebody who'd used the knife to exit or enter put it back in the block for the knives? I agree. What they don't tell you is that the fibers that they used for dusting the fingerprints are exactly the same fibers that were found on the actual cut blind. It's a very, very clear domestic connection. It's just, they use those fibers. So arguably as they dusted the knives, it wasn't necessarily that they had come from there at all, as in ripping open this blind. It could well have just been those fibers from the brushes, which would paint a whole different picture. And also if Darley wanted to create a scene, I'm not sure the first thing that she'd be thinking is, I'll just use this and then put it back in. I think it would probably be much more likely if she was that clever at sorting a scene out that she would just wash it or erase the fingerprints or not even use that knife because it was a serrated one which made it more difficult. You know, she had a nice choice of knives and if it was her house, then the knife that she's going to choose is probably going to be one of those nice old sharp ones that's going to give you a very clean entry, right? But that's the theory. But I agree, why would somebody do it? Neighbours a few days earlier had said that there'd been this really weird dark car that kept cruising the area the weeks before the crime and that it would often stop near the Routier's house. The problem is that as far as the investigator is concerned, there is no motive. There is no one that they can imagine would choose to harm them. So there is no reasonable guide to lead them to somebody that would have wanted to harm them. Equally, as we know, like with Richard Ramirez, the night stalker, people don't always need a reason. People aren't always coming in because they want to steal, because one of the other things was she had loads of that flashy jewelry all over the countertop. But it doesn't mean that it isn't possible. It might not seem probable, but probable versus possible are two completely different stretches. It just means you have to think differently about the psychology and possibility of other human beings. A big problem that we do have is that we know that Darren had on occasion done an insurance job because he wanted to make some money and it does seem that he had asked around a couple of times whether anybody could stage a robbery so that he could basically claim on the insurance because his business was in a little bit of trouble and he was in around, as I said earlier on, just over $20,000 in debt. He'd even asked Darley's stepfather, Bob Key, whether he knew somebody who might be able to come in, steal from the house and take some jewellery, etc. And then he'd be able to get the money and pay out the burglar from the proceeds. I'm going to say, Darren, that is not your finest moment. It's also not something that's uncommon. But you have to ask yourself, if he's having those conversations with people, is there a potential that somebody came in to do that, got spooked, ended up doing something insanely over the top 
or was it somebody who went in because they did have that capacity and intended to steal but then saw them and just had that criminal intent and made use of it i know it doesn't sound probable i'm just saying i think it could be possible even though darren did completely deny that there was an affidavit that had been signed that said that he actually had done that and he did have to admit it in the end but again he was just saying that at the time a lot of this was to do with the fact he was trying to show that his wife was not involved in any of this Darley has always given different types of evidence you know one officer said that she'd struggled with the person who'd been there another time she said that she just woke up to it all happening another time she said that she has no idea what happened and then she was found writing about it to a friend and basically saying that she didn't know what happened but Again, these are semantics. What she tends to be saying in all of these circumstances is, what I do know is I did not kill my kids. I know there was someone there. I don't really know the details. Maybe I'm trying to build the details. Maybe somebody's told me certain things and elements about the details and now I've become part of my memory and I think I remember it that way. But the one thing that she's always said is that she knows that someone came into the house and that a guy harmed her and her children. It's conflicting, she changes the story, please go and watch all the documentaries, you'll find out about it and come to your own conclusions. But the one thing that's always been very clear is that she did not give any distinct details about who the attacker was. She basically is saying that as far as she's concerned, he just was in dark clothes. People also will throw at me, well, if she was that much of a light sleeper that she could chill with her children downstairs and fall asleep, how could she not hear an intruder coming in and so on and so forth? I get it. But when you're a mum and you're near your baby, you're also programmed to actually hear that baby in a way that you don't hear anything else. You're like naturally acclimatised to your baby's movements. So if the baby isn't next to you, you'll get a deeper sleep. Ask any mum who's exhausted with a baby and then somebody comes and takes it downstairs for two hours whilst you can relax and then you feel like you go into a coma because you're exhausted and your baby isn't there to wake you. You know, you might wake up with big boobs that are milk leaking because they want a drink downstairs. That might wake you up, but you'll have got this lovely sleep. That's what happens. Another issue that we have with the evidence that was presented is that there were loads of bruising that came on Darla's arms a few days after she'd been released from hospital. Doctors said they were too fresh. I don't agree. I've looked at them. I've had really bad accidents where my arm has gone like a shade of yellow and then within a week or two, it's like purple. I don't believe that, you know? I don't believe that medics always know what they're talking about. I really don't. Some people bruise in one way, other people bruise in another one. I have an iron condition, I bruise if you literally flick me, but the point is, a lot of people don't have that same kind of reaction. They say, as far as they're concerned, she got someone else to do it, so I imagine they were implicating Darren, or that she did it herself. Well, those bruises would have taken some work. So again, you've got to make your own decision out of this. The police always struggle with the fact that the actual blind that they got in through was ripped with a knife, whereas you could have just pulled it off. I get it. And they can't understand why she wasn't murdered as well. Why was the overkill with her children's bodies and not her? You know, why wasn't she dead too? I understand their conflict. I really do. Another issue that goes against Dali is that when the forensics came round and like were kind of going run through of what could have happened, they sprayed a chemical called Luminol. I don't know if you've ever seen it. You might think your place is clean, but if they spray it and there's any like bodily fluids, it lights up like unbelievably. And it shows you patterns, the way that blood sprays, etc. And they can see things that your naked eye can't see. And one of the things that they've noticed is that it's in the sink and that almost it looked like it could be somebody washing blood off their hands. And that therefore some of Darley's blood that was around the sink looked like it had been wiped up with a towel. And therefore was she trying to make it look like she'd been stabbed somewhere else when she'd actually been stabbed over the sink. Equally, I'm imagining that whole scene with her staggering around, probably putting a towel on her. Who knows what was in the sink? Maybe she does like get a wet towel. I don't know. But again, there's two ways of looking at them, isn't there? And the fact that she never mentioned standing by the sink to the police doesn't necessarily mean that she's guilty. I mean, she's got two children that are dead on the floor and dying on the floor. Is she really computing the scene? Would she really know in that moment where she was and what she was doing? In fact, 
I would imagine that if she was cool, calm and collected during this experience and doing it, then she would probably have a really good understanding of how she was going to play out the story because that's what you tend to do. Look at Diane Downs. She's somebody who had a story ready. It was a terrible story, but it was a story. She is much worse at this story. It feels more like she could have been dealing with trauma. Again, there's a piece of testimony where her son, it looks like if she had stabbed him, there would be blood on her in a certain way and blood on him in a certain way and blood on the knife in a certain way. And as far as they're concerned, it matched. Again, more conflicted. Who is telling the truth? What is the reality in this? One of the biggest killer pieces of forensic is what I've told you. The bread knife in the kitchen, this invisible fiber. Apparently it was 60 microns long, made of fiberglass coated with rubber and that that fiber could only belong to the window screen that was cut. And because Darren's story was validated by Dali, i.e. he ran downstairs, they know that it couldn't have been him because she'd have seen him do it. So it could only have been her, right? But that's the problem, isn't it? Because that fiber isn't necessarily quite as sturdy in evidence as we'd like to believe. And there is a, that big problem for me. You know, 75 yards or meters or something away from the house, it's got this sock with two small spots of blood from the kids. It's not got any of Darla's blood on it. So how could she have got out in the time frame? It's like such a short time frame. They think that she carried the sock out three houses away to make it look as if it had been dropped, but there was no blood on it. There was no blood on the back patio. There was no blood trailing into her house that way. You know, she lost significant amounts of blood. The way that they brought the sock into it as a prosecution to make it make sense was that Darley had killed the boys, then before hurting herself, quickly taken this sock to look like she'd, as an intruder, wiped the knife to get rid of prints, then ran up the road, discarding the sock, running back, then stabbing herself and carrying on after making the scene a complete disaster and then calling the police. But they determined that one of her children had only been dead a very short amount of time and also that the injuries of the child that died would have had to take a certain amount of minutes for them to have died. And that that time was a very small amount of time because she was on the phone to the emergency services for a very long time. So because of that, she does have to be a bit like her same bolt and have all her senses around her and not be seen by anybody and not be bleeding. And when you actually look, it's very hard to imagine how she'd do that. And you kind of have more questions than answers, don't you? Because you're like, is that really a key piece of evidence that you'd have used? Why wouldn't you have had it closer to home? Because obviously if it's 75 yards away or whatever, likelihood it might not have been found. Wouldn't you have left it somewhere closer? You know, it feels a little bit like they really want her to be guilty. And no matter what she says or what evidence is presented, they are absolutely going to arrive at the same conclusion that Darley deserves death. To put it in context, once Damon had been stabbed, the medics say that he couldn't have lived for more than six minutes. And even if you extend that, as some people have said, and say nine minutes, well, that would have given her a very short amount of time because she was on the phone for five minutes and 44 seconds to 911. And then she was in the presence of an officer and Darren. So to some degree, how would she get through the garage step through that slit, go over a back fence, run completely barefoot for yards and yards and yards, clean herself up blood-wise and make sure that the place was staged. Even for me, I try to work that one out and I'm really struggling with it. I can't understand how that would have worked. But because they extended that six minutes to potentially nine minutes, they managed to piece it together for the jury. They managed to make it look like, without a doubt, she was guilty. I mean, it conflicts me. Because I'm thinking if she's a calculating murder, why not wait till the kids are definitely dead? Would you really stab yourself so severely? Would you let cops look at your diary? I mean, would you have your interview without a lawyer? If you really were somebody who was that capable of acting utterly hysterical as she does on the phone, wouldn't you put on a massive scene when you got to the hospital as well? And I guess 
the fact that she did that horrible thing where she's like spraying silly string on the grave, that is a totally terrible thing to do. It's really tasteless. But then she was a bit tasteless, wasn't she? No disrespect. You know, that sounds judgmental. I'm just saying she was really like extravagant. She wanted people to notice her. So the TV cameras are on. There's been a two hour service. She wants people to kind of see that she's celebrating her son's birthday. And it was probably more a performance than a reality. But I don't really understand why she went ahead with that. And I did hear her in an interview say, if I'd have wanted to make myself seem guilty, that would have been a really good way to have done it. If I'd known that they were really going for me because I felt like I was guilty, you know, if I knew that I'd killed my children, the last thing I'm gonna do is put on a scene like that because it doesn't take two and two to come to five, does it? When you're doing that, you get two and two is four, she must be the murderer if you suspect her and that's what's going on. And the other thing is, why would she kill two of her children and not her third? And why kill the kids at all? She was doing on them. Why not kill Darren? Darren was worth $800,000 dead. She was worth $250,000 dead. And the kids were only worth $10,000. In fact, their funerals cost $4,000 more. So if it was about money, stress, and all those things, why not kill Darren? I do have to give it to Darren. He is somebody who stood by Dali, even though he's now with somebody else. He still says that she was an amazing mother, amazing wife. He has no idea why anybody believes that she is guilty. He also can't understand why people would think that he would stand by somebody who'd murdered children that he loved. And he just feels that the story itself makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And yes, he does worry at times that maybe he was speaking out to people about the fact that he had items in his house that were worth a lot of money. Because on one level, he was saying he could pay a burglar to come and do it as a fit-up job. But I guess his worry is that potentially it could have been somebody else who heard or somebody else that found out about it who thought that they would come and actually steal and burgle from the home, which would fit the dark car that was around the house at that time. You know, it wouldn't have taken more than a few views into their house to have seen the kind of material that they had. Like I said, loads of gold and diamond jewellery all over the counter services. So if I'm gonna rob a house, because I've heard that somebody's got wealth, that would possibly be a place that I'd go. And that wouldn't be related to Darren, that would be related to Darren chatting out and people finding out about it, who shouldn't have found out about it. And other people have suspected that maybe Darren wanted Darla dead, that he wanted to hire somebody so he could claim on her insurance money. In fact, I do believe it is his auntie who's kind of felt that that was more possible and probable than it was that Dali had killed children. And that's actually caused a family rift. But it does say something, not that I'm saying Darren's in any way culpable, but that if the auntie of Darren thinks that it's more likely that her nephew has killed the children than her niece-in-law, because that's how little she can connect with Dali being a murderer, we have to listen to those potentials, not that he was the murderer but that a family member is willing to deny him his innocence over Darley. Even when the prosecution talk about the fact that she was thinking about getting divorced, it's not true. They both say it wasn't true, but yes, they had fallouts. Yes, they had arguments. Yes, she went and stayed with a friend on an occasion. Believe me, most of us have done that. That is just a way of getting noticed, isn't it? It happens all the time. And Darren said that this would be something that would regularly happen for years. They'd have a, a spat but it would always be something that was minor. He adored her. He'd always been faithful. She'd always been faithful to him. And when Dali is asked about the potential that Darren could have hurt her, she really doesn't buy into that either. And you would, wouldn't you? I mean, if you really are a narcissist and you wanna get away from prison, then it is a relatively easy way to throw somebody else under the bus, isn't it? To suggest that your partner's guilty. I think there are so many scenarios in this, aren't there? Like, even the ones that I've talked about, I can't say either way. I can't tell you whether Darren hired somebody to kill his wife, whether it was a burglary gone wrong, whether it was genuinely a case of her snapping, having a psychotic episode and murdering God's children. I can't tell you whether she actually did just manipulate the situation, hoping that she'd get away with murder. All I'm saying is that I don't really understand when there seems to be so much conflicting evidence and when she's been committed to death on circumstantial evidence that 
we're in a situation where she hasn't been given another appeal because it really feels like there are new elements to this case. And there's so many conflicts of interest in it when you look into it and so many different stories around this. And the one thing that has always remained absolutely true is that Dali will never admit that she killed her children. She's been interviewed so many times. She's very open to it and she absolutely refutes it on every level. She says that she loves her children, that if she goes to the death penalty, she'll be innocent and those taking her life will be guilty. And she's actually on a couple of occasions said the same line. So if you do watch the documentaries and you listen to that same line, you might be like, well, that's very rehearsed. It is rehearsed. It will be rehearsed. She's making a plea. She'll have practiced that plea for a very long time. And she knows now that more people are gonna judge her. So she wants to make it clear how she feels it will sound rehearsed. Don't judge her because of that. Before I actually conclude this, I think I do have to say that what I struggle with is the prosecution's bias. Why did they make it as if the family were in dire straits financially? They were not. Why did they make out that they were terribly behind with the IRS? They were not. It's normal to be behind when you have private companies. Why is that even evidence? Another piece that the prosecution used was that they were behind on the mortgage. They weren't behind on the mortgage. The month that they didn't pay, their children had been murdered and they probably weren't thinking about when the payment was due. Why did they make that into something that was used against them? In fact, throughout this case, it feels like the prosecution and then after they win, just have always grasped at straws, including saying that Darren was involved. You know, there was no evidence to back it up. No evidence at all. DA's office have got nothing, but they're just gonna name a potential suspect without any evidence at all. Just a way of assassinating his character and also assassinating his validation of her character. So this does feel very much like there was a decision made and they were gonna make her guilty and anyone who was gonna stand up for her was gonna be dragged down with her. One of the most odd things about this case is that, okay, she's been sent to death as far as they're concerned, but no one outside of her immediate family has ever even been investigated. You know, you imagine that this woman's life may end you understand the magnitude and seriousness of this crime, but no standard procedure was carried out. No standard procedure. They didn't rule in the possibility of anyone else. They ruled out the possibility that anyone else could have carried out this murder. That's not standard procedure. It is not your job because an ex-detective who's retired comes in and said, it's definitely her, that all doors close. As far as I'm concerned, that again shows dangerous bias. Like I said, this case is a conflicted one. For me, it's unsolved. It's not that I'm saying that she isn't guilty. She might be guilty. I'm saying, do you feel after listening to me beyond unreasonable doubt that this woman should go and receive the death penalty? That is what a jury's job is to do. Can I look and unquestionably, beyond reasonable doubt, state that this is the only person who could have killed these children? Because if there is a shred, then she should be granted her final appeal. And that's the problem. They don't want to let her out. And she's only got one more go at this. She may well be executed, and some of you listening may hope that that happens. Some of you listening might not buy any of the conflict that I feel. Personally, I think that she should be granted a retrial with the new evidence. And from there, if she's found guilty, well, maybe that's a fairer trial. I do also want to make it clear that she can be tried again to some degree because they only tried her for her youngest son's murder. And that was done in case they didn't get the death penalty or life on that young murder. Because if you kill somebody under the age of six, you basically can be put to death. So they kept the other one as a non-tried case so they could try her again, just in case. That's how much they wanted her sent down. That's the provocation of feeling that Darlie Routier created in these police officers and in those who prosecuted her. I don't know who's right and wrong. All I'm saying is, I feel deeply uncomfortable at this point 
that this woman, unless something changes, is going to be put to death. And she's had over 20 years on death row, and that is a long time. And let me tell you, her young surviving son loves the bones of her. Her ex loves her bones of her. Her family love her, and every single one of them have stood by her. Every single one of them support her, and so do millions of other people. Is that not enough to cast just enough reasonable doubt that even jury members now believe, just as the author who condemned her does, that just maybe Darlie Routier was convicted without trial before an investigation ever really began? I know that it's been a big one. I know you're as confused as me. Thanks for joining me. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. I hope you've enjoyed at least my own personal conflict whilst I've talked through this case. I didn't just want to go through dates. I didn't just want to go through chronology. I just wanted to tell you as I feel it, because I feel that there is an issue where we may have made a mistake. And that for me is enough to make sure that appeal happens and a retrial ideally occurs. And maybe, just maybe, she gets a fair trial. However that ends, take care.